Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You are listening to Your Money Momentum. My name is Tom Kennedy, and I have Kevin Curley here, and we are doing the mid-month podcast. Kevin, what's going on? The heat finally broke. No more triple-digit days in Dallas. Heat finally broke. Football is back. Uh, Those poor Jets, Tom. (laughs) Yeah, poor Jets or poor Giants. I mean, I don't know what's worse, getting blown out 40 to nothing by the Cowboys or having your star quarterback break his ankle or his Achilles or whatever he did in the first play. After a month of hype on hard knocks, it's just Uh, over after three plays. Oh, I'm so excited. I hate Jets and Jets fans. So uh, it's... I feel bad for him. So we'll we'll strike a good balance there. Sorry, Jets fans. You don't deserve this. They don't beat the Bills, so good for them. That was actually pretty impressive. That was that was shocking. I mean, Josh Allen and Joe Burrow apparently not not. I guess they're done. Their career's over. They're not good anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, Eight let's uh, let's uh, let's jump into it. So we'll start where we usually do with our central bank roundup, which will be timely with uh, CPI reports coming out tomorrow, and this will be two days two days old when it airs. Uh, We'll go into our five good minutes, cash is king, what that looks like, and then we'll end with our uh, mailbag question. So let's jump into the central bank roundup. Shine those boots. It's time for central bank roundup. So we had Jackson Hole last month. It was kind of, it, it was uneventful, to be honest. It wasn't like last year, that's for sure. No, there was no big reaction. It seemed like they just were consistent. Hey, yeah, we might be done raising rates, but we might keep going on raising rates. Uh, We have more work to do on inflation. We're not done yet, but it's going okay. We're closer to the finish than we are at the beginning. First last year, it was, you know, (laughs) from again. Well, well, (laughs) it's last year's news. That's the problem. And like we've said before, the market doesn't really typically react um, the second time around on on the same news. It kind of grows callous to it. I think that's what you're seeing and it's just kind of behind us. So it really was uneventful. I think he was a little more hawkish uh, than expected, and the markets didn't really go one way or the other. Yeah, and now we get all the good commentary out. So, for example, Bridgewater, the largest hedge fund in the world, uh, one of their co-CIOs, Bob Prince, was in the Financial Times saying that don't expect rate cuts to come next. Uh, he thinks that the core inflation is likely to bottom out between three and a half and four percent. So the Fed has a lot more work to do if they're serious about getting to their two percent target. And thinks that cash is a great alternative. And he said the biggest problem right now is that all the spending that's happening in households isn't a credit expansion. They're not putting it on their credit cards. They're not taking home equity loans. They're not doing that. It's just coming by income. So people's incomes up from wage increases. And they're just continuing to spend. So resilience in the American economy is good, but it means the Fed's probably going to keep going as long as inflation is above that two percent tar- target. Yeah, but it's not it's not great either. I think the the consumer's balance sheet is just going in the wrong direction. I mean, you have you know saving rates down. You have credit card debt to its highest ever, over a trillion dollars. You have auto loan debt, um, student loan debt, whatever you look at, it's going up, and delinquencies to pay this is is going up as well. So, I think it's all going in the wrong direction. I mean, look at the the thirty year mortgage just hit its highest since December two thousand a um, couple weeks ago. So, you know, there, there was an interesting stat by, um, I think it was BlackRock that put it out. They said that it would take a combination of up to 28% decline in home prices or more than a 4% reduction in 30-year mortgage rates or up to a 60% growth in median household incomes just to bring home affordability back to its 25-year average. Um, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty big stat. Yeah, I don't know which part of that's going to be the one that pops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I well, I, let, let's let's break it down. I mean, a sixty percent growth in median household incomes is not going to happen. Um, well, we've been soon. averaging five for the last couple of years, so if that compounds, it doesn't take that long to get there. But it's going to take the better part of a decade. And the wage inflation is what they're trying to fight. I think there's a better chance of home prices. I don't think you're going to see a twenty eight percent decline in home prices or 
a more than 4% reduction in the 30 year mortgage, 30 year mortgage is at seven and a half. Um, I think you know, that's the thing that'll change. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, three and a half percent and a side stat too, I thought was interesting. Speaking of, of real estate, 60,000 realtors have exited the sector over the last six months. Yeah, that's a good segue into the jobs numbers. So the beginning of the month, we actually saw the unemployment rate tick up uh, for the first time in a report. And we saw the jolts uh, decline as well. So we might finally see in the employment picture start to roll over. Yeah, and you have this perfect Goldilocks scenario where you have wage inflation starting to tick down in the right direction, which is what they want to see. You have unemployment rates starting to tick up, which is what they want to see. And you have inflation numbers, both core and headline, starting to tick down. Uh, this all signals that hopefully the Fed is done and that there is a cut coming you know, mid to, mid to end next year. But anything that goes wrong with any of those three, the market's already priced those scenarios in. And that's kind of the you know, the bears are making the case that that's the concern is that this market is overpriced. Valuations are, are elevated again. Um, and to get you to your 5,000 year end target in the S&P 500, hey, what's going to get it there? Well, I think I can actually predict the future for you. So oftentimes it's the riskiest part of the market we look for for leadership to say things have turned around. And in global markets, that's emerging markets. So they've had a surprising tale of resilience. There's one that's just bad. China, things are not going well. But if you go outside of China, so smaller countries like Ghana, Bolivia, uh, India, which population is huge, but the economy is not that big, or Mexico, things are okay. They're having 4% GDP growth. Their inflation rates, which are usually in the high single digits, are now running to 5 or 6%, which is where all the developed economies are. And their central bankers have moved on to thinking about cutting rates. And that's, uh, that's a good sign. And if they're ahead of the curve because they're kind of the riskier markets, uh, I think the U.S. maybe a year from now is looking at the same thing saying, all right, we're, we're now ready to cut rates. But not yet. We still got some more time. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned China. I mean, let's not let's not forget they're the second largest economy in the world. So if their growth it's starts bad. to fall, what what happens to the 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 growth of, of our economy? Does it have a ripple effect? And I think that's been the concern as of late. The last, you know, uh, who is the real estate? Um, who is the real estate well, firm? I, I let's, well, let's think about that. So in previous years, uh, or sorry, previous crisis for emerging markets, higher interest rates absolutely sunk them. And then the most recent one, uh, China, they were overly reliant on. And because of those two things, this time around, they were actually pretty resilient, it's a good word, to survive the interest rates. And on top of that, because of a lot of the stuff the U.S. has done, but what they found, their leading trading partner of China, not the greatest partner, they've been decoupling from China as well. So, you know, those commodity countries, I think that you're right, those are still pretty tightly controlled, um, you know, by Chinese interest in the sense that, they're the major buyers. So if they're not buying, those economies are going to fall apart. But the rest of them are doing pretty well and they're not as reliant as they used to be. I mean, if you look at Brazil and you look at Argentina, they have positive real interest rates. Argentina might in the next month or so uh, elect a new president that is the most hardcore Austrian economics guy that the South Americans have ever seen. So if those things happen, it looks pretty good for emerging markets. Now, so their saying, bonds have done well, but their stocks have not. So that's that's kind of the truth of GDP is well. They're paying their debts. And so those have rallied. The stocks haven't come yet quite yet. Well, the, you know, the, the, the stocks could follow. And I think a lot of it has to do yeah. with the, the strength of the dollar. Um, you know, if the dollar continues to rally, I think it's going to be very difficult for the emerging markets or just international in general to, to catch a, a sustainable bid, if, if you will. Um, but we'll see. Let's talk about those dollars in our next segment, which will be five good minutes. And this month's topic is cash is king. Um, Tom, U.S. money fund assets, so money market assets, have set a record $5.4 trillion. This is low risk money that is earning, in many cases, above 5% for the first time in our professional lifetimes, but really a decade and a half. Uh, yeah, somebody, I would say close to eight, 18 years. Yeah. I mean, you got, you got, depending on 
the money market fund and 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 dollar amount. I mean, you can get north of five and a half percent on some of these money markets, which is just it's amazing. And the big question we get from clients is, well, I'm looking at my savings account and I'm getting under two or I'm getting under one still. And mm -hmm. it's a savings account is very different from from a money market. Kevin, I don't know if you want to go into the, the differences of uh, of the two, but it's going to be. Well, I want to talk about the interest rate part first. And sure. so if you're with one of these bulge bracket banks, so Bank of America, JP Morgan, all those that are very depositor heavy, those savings accounts are typically paying 0.01. I had a client I spoke to recently. Oh, we're getting a great interest rate at Bank of America. We're platinum clients. I'm like, well, let's go look it up. It was like 0.02. That's <laughs> like, yeah, you're not getting anything. That, that's not even competitive. And that's just a, that's a traditional savings account. If you go to the high yielding savings account, I mean, you're not going to break two percent. You're going to be under two percent in the big four: Wells, uh, Bank of America. Uh, you know, the ones you the ones you just mentioned, Chase. So this isn't even two percent. This is 0.02. O2, so two basis points out of 100 when money markets are fighting over 5%. So let's let's jump into money markets from those savings because you're getting nothing uh, if you're a JP Morgan and Bank of America, 0.01%, nothing. Um, you got to get out of that. So cash is king. The key, the key here is what do you do with that cash? So you mentioned money markets uh, and what's the difference? So money market is going to be an investment fund that holds different instruments as opposed to savings account is something that the bank holds and FDIC insured. The money market has two types. One is government backed and one is not government backed. I always encourage clients to do the government backed because this is supposed to be very safe. You know, this is your cash. This is trying to earn a little bit of interest. Uh, and in that money market, they're typically going to hold short term debt instruments. So that can be U.S. Treasury bills. Uh, it can be auction securities. So things that Fannie and Freddie issued their debt and some of that short term stuff. Those are considered agencies because they're government agencies. Uh, it can involve U.S. government repurchase agreements where you're borrowing on the short term and they're going to give you a little bit of interest. So it's a little bit complicated. It can have accounts receivable. It can have a lot of different interesting things in there, but all really high safety. And so earning 5% on very safe money is really attractive. The one major problem with money market accounts is they are subjected to prevailing interest rates. So if interest rates were to mm -hmm. fall to 2 your money market's not paying five anymore. It's only right. paying two. So why don't you well, why don't we go from there, Tom? Give me your feedback on money markets versus savings accounts. No, you know, you you hit the nail on the head. One, there that you got full liquidity. So you know, clients say, well, what about six month CDs or, or bonds? And you know, the challenge is they're not as liquid as money markets. But to your point, these money markets typically reprice every thirty days. So as as interest rates go back down the opposite direction, you're you're going to have the corresponding interest rate go down as well. So if you want to lock in this high rate of 5% or more, there's other short-term investments that are cash and cash-like, and those could be short-term treasury bonds. Um, you know, the two-year treasury is what? It's north of north of 5% right now, and that's locked hey, Tom, in. How, how do you buy treasury bills? So you can buy them a couple different ways. One, you can buy the individual treasury bill um, and hold it to maturity, or you can invest in ETFs or mutual funds that hold a... Uh, a collection of these T bills, as they're called, um, and they have the yield, and those are more liquid. You can go in and out. The challenge with that is that you're not holding these to maturity. The the fund itself is, and sometimes they get out and into these, and um, it's going to fluctuate in price. The NAV or the the price of the actual mutual fund or ETF can fluctuate as rates go up. Um, so that's kind of the give and take with with getting exposure through an ETF or, or a mutual fund. But if you have enough money to diversify, sometimes buying the actual T bill itself outright is uh, is, is is the way to go. Yeah, and there's two ways to buy T bills. One, you can go directly to the U.S. government through the Treasury, and you can go on their website and set up an account. And if you buy those, you can hold them to maturity. If you were wanting to sell them before maturity, you got to transfer it in a brokerage account, which is the second way you can buy these T-bills is working with a financial advisor or somebody who has licenses necessary to go buy these debt instruments. They can buy them for you. And, you know, 5% is great. Even if you go out two or three years, I mean, the seven and the 10 year are yielding four and a quarter, 4.3%. So if you're in your seventies and you want to lock in a portion of your portfolio for over 4% for the rest of you know, your expected longevity, you can do that and then have some stocks with the rest of it. So there's a little bit of something called duration risk when you get further out. But, you know, as far as your cash goes, buying one year and less treasury bills, uh, there's no credit risk associated with it. The duration risk is close to zero uh, and you're making five. Well, well let's, let's explain. Let's 
let's explain duration risk. Let's say you buy a 10 year treasury bill that's yielding, what is it? Four, four, three right now. You have to hold yeah. it for 10 years. If you were to get out of it, say in year five, because you need some liquidity, et cetera. Well, if, if rates are higher, that is going to be worth a lot less because you have to discount um, to sell to someone because they can go out into the open market and buy the same 10-year treasury bond at a higher interest rate. So for them to take that same year 10-year treasury bond at a higher interest rate, well, you got to discount yours to sell to them. And vice versa, if rates drop, which is by a good chance that it may, that 10-year treasury bond is now worth more because if you go out in the open market and the 10-year treasury bond's not yielding three and a half, but you got a four and a half, well, someone's going to pay a premium for that difference in yield. So that's why you have that inverse relationship between bond yields and bond prices. So that one downfall about holding the actual T-bills or treasuries themselves is that to get the the your return your return of par, your return of premium, you have to hold it the full duration. If you have to get out in between, it could be greater or it could be less than what you what you bought in for. Yeah, so I think another way to say that is your coupon rate or your interest rate or your return, if you hold it from day one to maturity, is gonna be whatever that stated amount is. If you got a trade in between, that's going to fluctuate depending on prevailing interest rates. So I would encourage you to work with a bond manager or a financial advisor or somebody to make sure you understand those risks and say, which ones should I own? How should I own them? Do they need to be managed? Can I just hold on to them? And, um, and, so, yeah. and, and, and I'll say more times than not, it, it's a combination too. And you don't just ever usually buy one treasury bill. You ladder them out. You buy different durations or maturities and you and you just ladder them out so you have one or two bonds maturing every year to give you your liquidity and then you just keep going out down down the curve and this helps to I'm more barbell in. guy but ladder is a great strategy as well well barbell ladder whatever you want to do however you want to split it up the point <laughs> being is you're not just going to buy one and i think that's a common mis misconception is that we're going to buy one treasury bill like we would do with like a mutual fund or etf and it's very very different yeah, before we move on from cash being king, let's quickly touch on CDs and municipal bonds. So uh, do you want to hit CDs and I'll take over munis? Yeah, so, you know, C CDs, it's going to be, they're, they're, they're issued by the bank. Um, you can buy them on the secondary market, but you have to go through, you know, an advisor or a brokerage account to get that pricing. And it works very similar to how a bond is, how a bond works that we just described, depending on what rates are at. Or you can go to your local bank and your local bank, they're offering pretty high competitive CD rates for the first time, again, because rates are high, but the difference between a CD is you're gonna be locked into that term. So if you do a one year CD, well, you're getting that interest rate for one year. If you have to get out, there's usually penalties involved. Um, if, you have, if you have to get out before that period, but you, what you what you do is you there's give and take. So for the liquidity, you're locking in that rate for that duration, whether it's six months, a year, or whatever it may be, versus the money market, you have full liquidity, but if rates drop over the next six months quite a bit, well, the interest rate on that money market is going to drop with it. Yeah, and don't forget, I mean, penalties, if you want to get it out early, each one has its own rules. So be careful, right. you know, whether it's one month or one quarter of interest for giving up. And then the last piece is looking at municipal bonds. So if you are somebody who hates paying taxes or are just simply in a high tax bracket, getting this type of income on your cash from municipal bonds can be very advantageous because you don't pay any federal income tax. Now there's a couple caveats for that. If you're in New York, you gotta buy New York bonds. California, you gotta buy California bonds. But if you're in Texas or Florida or another state that has no state income tax, you can buy any state's municipal bonds and you can cash in on these rates. So municipal bonds that are A-rated or better have a very, very low likelihood of defaulting, which means they're not gonna pay their money. Anything that's not that you know investment grade quality has a higher risk. Those are kind of the high yield munis. You might be able to get a much higher rate. So. For simple math, I'm going to use somebody who lives in New York who's paying about a 50% tax rate. If you're getting 3.5% yield on your municipals, it's actually the equivalent of getting 7% on one of those products we just talked about, like CDs, money markets, and treasury bills. And right now, I think there's actually an opportunity for those in high tax brackets to make more in the muni market than they are in the taxable fixed income. Um, it's not a simple market, as you know, Tom. No, and there's the there's the you know the the treasury ratio, which basically says is your your tax equivalent yield 
compared to your taxable yield, which where's the better bang for your buck? And to your point right now, the municipals, especially the higher tax bracket you're in, you're getting a little bit more bang for your buck in terms of, of yield goes. Now there's, it's not all, it's not all equal. There's credit quality, et cetera, but it, you're seeing that ratio widen out, which is favoring municipal bonds. Um, and yeah. with possible taxes going up, it might be a good, uh, a good area to, to look into. And it depends on where in the yield curve you buy. So for the first few years out, um, it seems about even on taxable yield. But if you get past about 12 years, there's a big ad- advantage to municipal bonds as far as how much they're yielding. Some of that's taking on duration risk and credit risk, but um, we can help you with that, obviously. Uh, but I think that evaluating your cash and doing something with it is new for everybody. It's not something, a game we've had to consider for the last 15 years. So if you're suddenly finding yourself not earning any interest and all your friends are getting 5%, you're going to want to participate in that. And there are ways to do it finally where you don't have to take a ton of risk. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's important because most most of our clients just assume that they're getting these high interest rates and they're not. The banks are not no. going to default to putting you into these accounts if they even offer them. So um, let's switch gears and and end with our final segment, the uh, the mailbag. It's time to hear from listeners as we open the mailbag. And answer your questions. So, first question: it, Are we going to see more bank failures? You know, we had the scare yes. in what was mid, <laughs> mid March, um, and and the answer is yes. So, enlighten us. So, uh, Meredith Missed Whitney, five thousand. Uh, oh God, yeah, Meredith well, Whitney. Look, you see, you can go together. She was one of the people who warned on subprime. Uh, I think she later had a big warning for. Municipal bonds of all things. Yeah, in 2011, and nothing right, happened. Take it easy. She's not she going to get them fired. all right. But right <laughs> now, uh, she was once dubbed the Oracle of Wall Street, is predicting that kind of the next financial crisis is coming in the sense that large banks are in good spots and all the other banks are in a ton of trouble. If you remember from the March failures, there's going to be a lot more bank mergers simply because the cost of running a bank is going up. So the only way to survive as your margins get squeezed is to get bigger. And so those mergers are something that's going to happen. So whether they're going to buy these banks uh, out of bankruptcy or from the Fed, or they're going to merge ahead of that to avoid any issues with, you know, U.S. housing prices falling and therefore foreclosures and then all these write downs happen. Uh, she thinks bank mergers is the way going forward. So whether you want to call it failures or, uh, you know, a strong partner finding a weaker partner and making an OK bank afterwards, I think that there's bank failures coming. Uh, they just had the same problem they had in March and none of them got fixed. We just kind of put out the fire. It's yeah. Still simmering. No, I, I agree. And we've had a big jump in interest rates. It's just, again, Huge. this is the second the second go around this year. So I don't think it's covered as much headline. And I think a lot of the... A lot of the banks at risk got weeded out pretty quickly in that first go around, but I agree with you. I think it's coming. I think you know, with with rates where they've gone and how bad bonds have gotten hit because of the jump in rates, um, it, it's inevitable. And I think you will see some some consolidation for sure. All right, our next question, Tom. As you know, I predicted five thousand for the S and P by the end of the year, and it's looking more and more like I'm going to need Santa to bring me a nice little rally at the end of the year to hit that number, but. You know, the midterm election year tends to be stronger uh, or sorry, this year prior to in between midterm and presidential it tends to be the strongest one. So we're, we're, we've been through that almost in September. It's almost over. Now it's time to switch gears for a presidential year. Uh, what seasonality say about presidential election years for markets? So pr- presidential years typically, if 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 memory serves, have stronger years than non-presidential years. Is that is that what you're looking at? Yeah, year one's the worst. Uh, typically, the new president's got a recession because the last president tried to hold on and get reelected and all those things. So uh, four is OK. Three is the best. One, not so good. And midterm years, it tends to be right after the midterms. There's this huge ah, sigh of relief. That's over and the markets rally. So four and two, those even years tend to be eh, pretty positive. Yeah, I think um, I think next year, hopefully, you know, it, it seems so far in, in the future right now. I, I think I think you might get close to your target. I think we're coming, you know, August, September, typically the the worst months, particular September. And we've been okay getting through these these last two months. So I think the fourth quarter this year, you might see a, a sprint to the finish. Yeah. All right. Final question. All right, Tom, recently the financial pros at Barron's interviewed a few guys like us and said, 
you know, what are the best investing books for beginners? Uh, I, I, they mentioned things like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, The Millionaire Next Door, uh, some of those classics that have become, you know, very famous, The Automatic Millionaire. Uh, what, what's your one or two book recommendations for, for those getting started? Well, you, you stole it from me. I was going to say Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I just think- That's okay. I didn't steal it. Baron stole it. Yeah, I just think it's a phenomenal book. It's an easy read. It's It doesn't speak over your head and you have so many aha moments and it just, I think, builds a good, good- I think you have to understand just- conceptually investing and, and, and what that looks like, um, to build a good foundation before you start getting into, you know, what is a stock and what is a bond and things that are more fundamental like that. I think conceptual con, you know, conceptions like that are, are important to build the foundation. So I, I'm a huge fan of uh, rich dad, poor dad. Yeah. I think for me, if you're interested in finance or trying to learn more about that, I think liars poker is still a classic and very entertaining. So if you like narrative nonfiction, it goes fast, introduces some concepts that we talked about today, like spreads on yields, how do bond prices work. There's a lot of things about that. If you're more, I just want to learn a little bit more. I want a philosophy on investing. I think Simple Wealth, Inevitable Wealth by Nick Murray is a really powerful book, especially for somebody getting started to understand where do I put my money and why? Yeah, you know, speaking of Michael Lewis, I mean, he's awesome. I love everything that that he puts out, but I I personally learn by historic events that happen and if that's you, pick up some of his books like Liar Poker or you know, The Big Short. Um they're just they're just great and puts a lot of context around some pretty important uh investment philosophies and events that that took place throughout throughout history. So, I'm a huge fan of Michael Lewis. Great. Well, thanks, Tom. Enjoyed it. See you next time. All right. Sounds good. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.